Motion by Council McGinn to receive. All in favor, any opposed, the vote. Okay, thank you. So I put together a PowerPoint presentation that I've just passed out um, to answer some inquiries as to how the small commercial exemption works and if it was accepted here in the city of Peabody. So basically, I'll give you a little background about the small commercial exemption. It needs to be voted on annually at the classification meeting. It's one of the um, items that needs council approval. And basically, it is an exemption that is eligible to class three commercial properties that have a assessed value of less than a million dollars and an average annual employment of no more than 10 people. And this exemption could be up to 10% of their property value, cannot exceed 10% of their property value. In the state of Massachusetts, only 12 communities have accepted the small commercial exemption, and there's a list attached to those that have. That have. Um, and we are provided annually with a listing of over 900 businesses that have an average of 10 or fewer employees. And then what we would need to do is cross-reference that list with our assessing database to determine if where that business is located is classified as commercial, and if it has a value of under a million dollars. We would need to also determine if there are multiple businesses in a, um, a building that all businesses would have to be under 10 employees in that business in order to qualify. And then once it's determined that the property qualifies, based on value of under a million and the business um, employees under 10, then we would apply the exemption to the property tax bill. The owner of the property gets the benefit of the exemption, not necessarily the tenants that are in the property. So annually, when we hold the classification hearing, the council votes on a shift as to how much um, the commercial and industrial and personal property will pay uh, for the residents. And by accepting the small commercial exemption, what that does is in effect increases the commercial tax rate to make up for that exemption that we're granting. So in the example that I've provided, the we're estimating that $5 million would be reduced in the commercial value by adopting the com this exemption, and that would increase the tax rate from 2411 to 2420 for commercial and industrial taxpayers. So basically, in summary, um, any property over a million dollars in value would pay more in property taxes. They would not qualify for an A exemption. And they would pay at least $90 more per year. The North Shore Mall, the largest taxpayer in the city, would pay an additional $28,000 per year. Um, and again, the exemption is applied to the um, property tax bill. So the owner of the property will receive the benefit, not necessarily the tenants. It might not necessarily be passed on to the tenants. So does anyone have any questions? I'll accept questions from councilors. Councilor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Susan. Um, can you clarify on the number of employees? Is that full-time, part-time, just straight, 10, um, regardless of how many hours? Please. Let me see. It's um, what is filed with the 
Division of Labor and Workforce um, Development Corporation, Office of Labor and Workforce. So I don't know exactly what their criteria is to determine full versus part-time. I believe that they take into account if somebody is hired mid-year, it's all averaged in, and they give us a, a listing of those, dis, the, those businesses that they've determined qualify meet that 10 or fewer employees. So you have currently have the list given by workforce? Yes, every year they provide that. <clears throat> okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilman again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you, um, and I know this might call for a little speculation on your part, but mm -hmm. if you can indulge me, why, why do you think so few communities in the Commonwealth have opted in on this? Well, when we classify and we shift already to the commercial tax base, we're already putting a burden on the commercial taxpayers. So this puts an additional burden on those taxpayers that don't meet the qualifications. So I, th I just think that um, just not a very popular option for cities and towns to accept. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to determine if a building on Main Street, if there's multiple businesses in there, to, to go through and determine, okay, if there's eight businesses in there, do all eight businesses have 10 or few employees according to the Department of Labor and Workforce Management's uh, requirements that would qualify? And if one of them, if nine of them do and one of them doesn't, they don't qualify for the exemption. And so your comment about there's already a shift, there's already a shift here, but lots of communities that don't classify the way we do mm -hmm. um, also have not opted for this. So, Right. They would pay, it would be the same tax rate. If there's no shift, there's no shift. Everybody pays the same tax rate. I see. So this, it can only go commercial to commercial. Co it can't correct. go commercial to residential. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. It's Thank being you. shifted to other commercial properties, not back to residential. And I think inherent in your comments, you're saying that um, the benefit goes to the property owner. So there's not necessarily that the, those business owners that we would potentially like to be helping were not necessarily helping Correct. because well, there's no guarantee that this, Correct. That they, that this is actually going to make it to them. Correct. Um, and, in, and, and there's probably significant reason to believe that much of it wouldn't make it to them. <laughs> Potentially. I see you nodding. So <laughs> I, a nod doesn't make it onto the record very well. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilor Tresh, you had your hand up? I did. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, even though I'm not part of this committee, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak. The, um, and, and I'm really keen on the um, not necessarily will help the tenant, will, will definitely be the, the owner of the building. And do you have an, any idea of the percentage of this group, which is owner-occupied business? Well, we've started to go through the list provided to see if we can get an estimate. And we're estimating probably several hundred would be owner-occupied. Out of? Out of 600 or so that would qualify. That would because qualify. Because they still have to be under the assessed value of a million dollars and meet the employment criteria as well. And do any communities make it part of the condition they need to pass it on to their tenants? Not that I'm aware of. Thank you. Councilor Turco. Thank you. It's, re it's really not a question, Susan. I just wanted to state for the record that, um, I mean, just the fact of, of transferring this uh, burden to our largest taxpayers I, at this point, I, I don't believe would be prudent. I get the gist behind it. I just truly don't believe that it's, it's a good idea to do that because we all know that it's not going to get transferred uh, down to the business owner. So it's likely why only 12 people. I think we all know that. So I just wanted to state that for the record, but thank you. Council Gould. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I know you're being respectful and holding back on comments, but I'd, uh, I'd be curious as to what your feeling is on this, please. Well, <clears throat> hearing the Robin Hood theory here of uh, uh, providing the extra burden to those that are greater than 10 and over a million in value, um, I, I feel they already, as Council Turco said, I feel they already carry a good burden to begin with, and uh, particularly f f due to the fact that they're not really drawing a lot of services. But um, I do know that the transference would only occur if the rent agreement for the building that you're in as a tenant uh, is set up with uh, a CAM charge, common area maintenance charge, which typically includes your real estate tax. It sounds to me like it'd be so small that, you know, if I'm one of 10 tenants in a building and there's a couple of thousand, I mean, on a million dollars, it's uh, 17,000 in roughly 17,000 in taxes, you know, if there was a small exemption, I mean, it's, it's not going to do a lot for those businesses. I, I, I really don't. I think it has a it has a nice name, but I don't think it serves the purpose of helping to incent businesses anywhere to do anything. And if anything, it just I think creates some resentment on the part of any other business to want to do business here. Council McGinn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I concur with your comments. I I think in addition to that, we have to consider the impact on the department. I'm I'm not sure administratively how much additional work this is going to be, but, I, you know, to pass on this uh, so-called benefit, um, we, we may be looking at some effective or at least partial additional headcount, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure we want to consider taking on uh, the additional administrative task to, to oversee this as well, another, another uh, reason for probably not going down this path. So I, th I think uh, the purpose, I, I know uh, Council Manning Martin had brought up the issue. She's not with us this evening because she's on uh, vacation. But uh, I think uh, it was more to educate us on what this could potentially be. I think we've heard it. You've done a nice job of presenting it. We appreciate sure. uh, you coming this evening. I don't think there's any vote needed. We've already had voted not to exempt. So. Um, and you can only do this at classification time anyway. So uh, my perspective is we got the report of progress and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Council McGinn. Just a suggestion, um, since we did take the time to review this and uh, you know, perhaps a, rec uh, a motion on a recommendation to the, to the committee so that when we reach uh, November for tax classification that uh, there'll be a recollection that we that we evaluated this and we had sound reason to not pursue it. So if, if great you're, idea, go ahead. So if you're agreeable to that, I would uh, move that the finance committee recommend uh, not adopting the small commercial exemption, small business uh, exemption. Uh, so moved. You've heard the motion by Council McGinn. On the motion, any questions? All, I don't think I need a real call. All in favor? Any opposed? Let's vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. For taking the time. Uh, next item on the agenda, uh, item B is Chapter 90 Local Transportation Aid Funding for fiscal year 2019. Mr. Gingrich. Thank you. Um, the mayor submitted a letter notifying the council that, well, Approximately 1.2 million would be available for Chapter 90 Street re Road repairs uh, for FY 2019. At that time, after July 1, we'd be submitting uh, an appropriation um, for that amount to uh, approve that money and, and have it available for use. Questions? From the council, Council Turco. Mike, just re remind me, please, Mr. Chairman, through you to Mike. Uh, could you remind me of what we got last year? It was about the same. It was. And just real quick, how many streets in Ward One do you think I could pave with all that 
<laughs> Thank you, that's all. About a quarter of a mile. Just saying. Any other questions on be behalf of the uh, council, finance committee? Being none, Mike, what, what, what do you need from us in terms of a vote to? We're going to come back with a formal uh, transfer at, at, um, that, so it's effective after July 1 because it's next fiscal year. So we're just going to wait. Okay, so we don't need any voting. No vote. Okay, no votes required. Wow, that's good. Two in a row. Next item on the agenda, item C, competitive bids for bonds and notes. Mr. Gingrich. Uh, the mayor uh, presented the council with the information regarding a recent bond and note sale in March. And uh, we did well in terms of our interest rates. And uh, I'm here to answer any questions regarding that. Questions by the Finance Committee. How's our rating holding? Excuse me? How's our rating holding? The rating was downgraded to a double, um, AA2 from AA1. Moody's uh, evaluates on a variety of metrics, and as they were going through, they felt that at this point in time, we fit with the other group better than the first group. <clears throat> but still at this, basically the same tier, but we're in the middle tier versus the upper tier. Did they give uh, specifics in terms of what's driving it down that one? I, to, to me, double A1 and double A2, double A, um, you know, we're in the same place, but uh, with a little bit of differential, it might be the difference of 10 basis points or something of that nature? About five to seven. Five to seven basis points. So you're not talking about significant swing. But what I'm curious is, did he give you any indicator? Was it the reduction of the reserve? Was it the um, perspective of uh, increased capital funding requirements going to the future? Any, any sense of what they, it, what they were doing? It's a combination of all of those things. The uh, additional use of reserves to some extent. And we don't have the reserve levels that they like to see for a double A1. The additional debt service burden because of the Higgins School and some of the other projects that have come on recently. And the wealth factor of the community and the poverty factors, there's a lot of those uh, domestic kind of factors that influence their decision too. Thank you, and I, I, uh, I only asked the question because there, there, you know, a lot of people, when they heard about a, all they heard was the word downgrading. They didn't hear downgrading from AA1 to AA2, uh, five to seven basis points. Um, you know, it was like, you, you don't want people to think that the sky is falling because the sky isn't falling. Uh, it's just a matter of categorizing what the credit risk is. And, uh, you know, something to watch, but we're certainly a long way from junk bond uh, status. Oh. So uh, I, I think we're, we're still doing very well. We're, we're still considered one of the top rated communities in terms of bond rating. Can, can we make sure that that gets on the record? We're still considered one of the top rated communities for bonding. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gingrich. Uh, Council Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Either uh, if through you or, or you could answer it on mic, um, on drop of five to seven points on a scale of what? How does the scale work, Mike? So a basis point is one one hundredth of a point. One ten, well, so there are 100 basis points to a percentage. There are 100 basic points to a percentage. Wow, okay. That's better than dropping from a 95 to a 90. 
if it was on that type of scale. Yeah. Um, on this bond issue, it's a 20-year issue. It's approximately, and I asked our financial advisors, and they project maybe $4,000 a year on, on an $8 million plus bond issue. That's why I appreciate you asking the question because a lot of people don't understand that and it's important that they understand that, again, the, the city is doing very well from a, uh, managing its finances, you know, part of the, uh, part of Mike's goal and part of the goal of the city is to balance the, its debt with its capital investment and its income and its, and its revenue production and, you know, having it's almost as bad to have too much in reserve. You know, nobody will ever criticize you for it from a bond rating agency because they're paid on, you know, what they say your risk rating is going to be. And the more certain it is, it's like going to the betting table and saying, I, I guarantee you that in the next time it falls, it's going to fall on red. And uh, so they get rewarded for that. And um, they're, they're hedging risk, so they always want your reserve to be as high as it possibly can be, and they want your revenue production to be as high as it possibly can be, and they want your obligations to be as low as they possibly can be, and they'll give you the best rating. But the job of the finance uh, director and the mayor is to balance the needs of the community with the availability of the funds without putting additional due burden and risk on the community, and I think this, this says they are doing a good job. Mr. Rosgano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, although I'm not on this committee, I appreciate you letting me speak. Um, I want to echo first, Mr. Chairman, your um, explanation. You know, a lot of the reason why we went down was because of the added debt being the Higgins and the really moving our city forward. One of the things that they did mention in this is also the um, current liability we have regarding our pension. And one of the things that they did mention in this was that most uh, Massachusetts m municipalities rated AA2 or above do establish an OPEB trust. That's something that we do not have currently. Right now we pay as we go. Is there anything in the works through Mr. Chairman to you, Mr. Gingras, of establishing a trust to at least decrease some of that liability? I've been working on you know, gathering the paperwork and information on that, and we do want to bring that forward and adopt a trust and then come up with a plan on how we fund it annually. Um, even if we do um, a minimal portion, the rating agency will look favorable on that. Through you, Mr. Chairman, back to Mr. Gingras, when do you anticipate you coming forward with a recommendation? Um, I would try to do that probably in the fall, uh, September-ish, after we get through budgets. Any further questions? Being none, thank you, Mr. Gingrich. We appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk about this. Thank you. Item D on the agenda is the discussion regarding submission of information, Essex North Shore Agricultural and Technical High School District. And we have with us this evening Beverly Ann Griffin Dunn, who is our school committee person here in Peabody, as well as uh, our school committee representative for the Regional Vocational High School. Thank you, Beverly, for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I wasn't quite sure what type of information you folks would be interested in, but I did send in a copies of the finalized budget for the vocational school. I think you had all received copies of a preliminary budget. So if you have a few minutes, I'll give you an update on that budget, and then I have a couple of other items that may be um, things you've been interested in, and I'd be glad to answer questions. And if I haven't got the answer, I have a pad of paper here to take down your questions, and I promise to come back with the answers. So um, the budget was passed on, let's see, 
Uh, excuse me, one second. Sure. Mr. Chairman, move to receive late communication. Uh, On the motion to receive late communication, all in favor, any opposed, the vote. <laughs> thank you. Forgot that part. And I want to thank um, Tim Spanos for uh, helping me to get those copies to all of you. That was really wonderful, a wonderful help to me. Um, you'll notice that there's a narrative and uh, the budget accompanying that. Those documents are not terribly different from the ones you received for the preliminary budget. However, there were some cuts made to the budget, and the PBD assessment is up about 124000 under $125,000 over last year. Some of the things that Dr. Lupini went back and cut uh, on the recommendation of the school committee were Proposals for three additional new programs, they would have been wonderful programs. They would have greatly helped our students get right into the workforce after graduation. But based on budgetary considerations, they scaled that back. There is one program going in, and it's really um, going to help the students immensely. It's, um, if I can find it quickly, it's, uh, let me see. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, well, I will find it, I promise you. But it's um, <laughs> the majority of increases, as with any budget this time of year, uh, it's with personnel. And their step and raises that are already uh, figured through the budget and through their uh, negotiations, there were increases that were planned for that were able to be cut on insurance, which was a very pleasant surprise. The um, uh, the program, I'm sorry, it's engineering technology. It's a, it's a wonderful program for today. They had to add two new English teachers and one additional math teacher. That, in, that did account for some of the increases in personnel. And the reason they needed to do that was to be able to have equitable distribution of students in the classrooms. They have to uh, plan for scheduling. Their schedule, of course, is different because of the, the uh, vocational model. So they needed those teachers uh, to bring class sizes down in English and math. Those, uh, those subjects are also, of course, they're concentrating on those with the MCAS scores. And they did very well. As a matter of fact, um, the Essex North Shore Agricultural and Technical School had the highest scores of any of the vocational schools in the state. We also saw a presentation, totally different meeting, but it was amazing the way that they're teaching there. They have some really great uses of curriculum, and uh, it's something that I'd like to bring to Peabody to show them how they're doing this. It's really very, very interesting. The um, CARES, Coordinated at Risk Education Support Program, is one that uh, is modeled after Assabet Valley. This is accounting for an additional school adjustment counselor. The vocational school is noticing the same thing we all are. Students need a lot of social and emotional help. And the school adjustment counselor really will help the students so that they are prepared to be able to go through a day at school and be successful. School resource officer, the Essex North Shore Agricultural District had been utilizing the services of Danvers Police and of Middleton Police. They now have a memorandum of understanding with the Danvers Police and will be hiring a dedicated school resource officer. Again, it's a necessary position in this day and age. And um, the only reason that they hadn't had one before was because the school is new. So those two, the two, two towns, Danvers and Middleton, were sharing that on an ad hoc basis, and now it's been formalized. You'll see that in the budget as well. Those are about the only changes that um, you know I wanted to bring to your attention. They may not have been in that preliminary uh, report, but just so that you know, when it came time to vote on that budget and voting on behalf of Peabody, I felt very confident that this was educationally sound. 
there had been some difficult cuts. I was kind of torn because those new programs would have been wonderful for the students, but we just couldn't do it. It would have been too much too soon. And I do hope that they pursue those programs. They'd be vital for the students in this area. It would help, I think, with some of the um, some of the students coming into the school presently, we have the 17 member communities, but there are students from presently 53 communities attending the school. And this year, they had students from 59 communities apply. One of the good things about our regional school is that they conduct an interview with every single student who applies. This year, they had 1,100 students apply. Peabody had 165 resident students apply to the Essex North Shore Agricultural and Technical School. And they're hoping and planning on a class of freshmen consisting of 360 students. The makeup of that, that uh, class will be reported back to us, and I will make sure you get that. The end of April is when they'll have those district statistics, and we'll know what our assessment will be as well. Even here in, in the budget, the assessment here is a preliminary assessment. It depends upon the state uh, funding, and um, they will firm up those numbers of students attending. So I'm open to any questions you may have. Council Roosevelt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you for letting me speak, even though I'm not part of the subcommittee. First, I just want to say thank you. I remember the first budget we got from Essex Tech was literally one page, and it had a dollar amount, and that's what we got handed. So I absolutely appreciate that there's facts there's figures, there's line items, there's expenditures. Um, so I, I truly appreciate that. Uh, I actually have two questions. N um, number one, I noticed that you were talking about staffing increases um, regarding, I believe it was English. Do they have staffing ratios um, at Essex Tech? They do. They do, and offhand, I can't remember them. They just went over them when we had this discussion at the, uh, the finance subcommittee level. That was one of the reasons that they did need to bring on those additional teachers. Okay. I'll get those numbers for you. I That's okay. I can't remember what they are offhand. Thank you. Um, so, I, I mean, as, as we all know, this is something that we basically just write a check for. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we have very good representation on uh, the school committee at Essex Tech, giving us a lot more feedback than we had at any other time that I can remember, so I appreciate that. Um, how is the superintendent search going over there? Actually, I, I'm glad you asked, because there were two things I wanted to tell you. First, in regards to the documentation that came through, working with Dr. Lapini is really wonderful. I noticed the difference as well. And um, everything at that school right now is geared towards being transparent to all the communities. Dr. Lupini, in my opinion, has done a wonderful job of being available to the communities to go out and speak. As you know, he's come to city council meetings, and he will be available as well if you want him to come and speak. And I know he can speak in much more detail than I, than I can. But um, really, it's been extremely positive working with him and, and learning more and more about the vocational school and seeing how he has put in some very strong, um, just some strong programs and guidelines for the staff up there. And we can all see it just with the documentation that comes out now here at our level. So it's been very, very good, very informative and very open. The superintendent search, one of the biggest considerations of the members on the school committee was again making sure it was a very transparent process. So what they decided to do was to have first they they, they had they thought they had were going to have four or five internal candidates for superintendent. So they opened it up kind of in a bifurcated um, system of the superintendent search. They had 
posted for internal candidates. They only received one. She was outstanding. And what the committee members did, we had an interview last week, but the decision was nothing against her. She was really very, very qualified. But they wanted to make sure that the process, again, was open. And they felt more confident if they opened it to the public. So it has been reopened as of March 30th. It was re-advertised. Uh, I can get a copy to all of you of the schedule. But by May, they anticipate having interviews of the additional candidates. The internal candidate, um, Dr. Heidi Riccio, will be pushed on as she's already a finalist. And then um, they will determine other finalists from outside and then put them all together for the school committee to make a final decision. If they are unable to do that, then we will look for an interim superintendent. Dr. Lupini will be leaving at the end of the fiscal year. And he has said he will, of course, do whatever he can for a smooth transition, but um, everything is timing. The Mass Association of School Committee was hired to conduct the search, and uh, they, uh, as I said, they, they are doing all the work right now on the scheduling. They're going to go through the um, applications. There will be a search committee formed, and that search committee will come up with three to five finalists, and then again, we'll start interviewing in May. All set. Uh, we have Four more minutes, uh, Councillor Sasla. Thank you. Um, I just had two quick questions uh, regarding what was the, um, the 2018, what was our number that we uh, contributed? Do you know? I couldn't find it in the paper. Actually, I, I don't know offhand. I can get it for you, but I know. Oh, you got, oh, oh you're still here. Thank you. I wanted him to check my math before he got up here. It was 3979299. Can't hear you. Three million nine hundred seventy-nine thousand two ninety-nine. Okay. Thanks, Mike. I'm glad you're still here. <laughs> Th thank you. And so my only question, and, and it's a good thing, and and I, and I just it was curious. I see. So we we basically fund it looks like about twenty-four percent of the overall budget. We have twenty-six percent of the student population, which is great. Was there any reason why, and maybe you shouldn't look, look a gift to us in the most, but I do want to just bring it up because it could be different the following year. So you, you said we had an increase of about 125,000. Um, was there a reason why, if it was proportionally, we should have picked up 284? I don't know if you picked up on that or, you know, looked at that at all. I'll be honest, a lot of this budget is driven by the foundation budget and the um not only the assessments, but the funding that comes down from the state. And the formula, I think the formula accounts for some of that money. Mm -hmm. So it's never precise. Okay. It really isn't because of the way that that formula, the funding formula works. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> With the two minutes remaining, any further questions? Council McGinn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Consistent with uh, Councilor Rosignol's comments, thank you for doing what you're doing and, and also for your level of engagement on this. Do you recall specifically the, uh, the two programs that they were not able to fund for fiscal 19? I know Dr. Lupini was pretty excited when he came here the last time about the programs they wanted to add and it sounds like weren't able to do all that. So I was just curious, I, I believe one of them was an advanced manufacturing uh, cur curriculum it was, and I have to tell you, I had this horrible, uh, oh my gosh, the feeling was awful when they presented it. I'm sitting there saying, oh, this is awesome. There were three programs. It was medical assisting, which we have at PB Veterans Memorial High School, business marketing, and agricultural mechanics. And, oh, it sounded great. And I'm sitting there, this is awesome. This is great for the kids. And then I said, wait a minute, it's going to cost money and burst the balloon right there. They had based those programs on workforce development needs. 
So in order to get a program up and running, it does take four years because you want to bring in your freshmen and then you expand it. And you know your first group of students will graduate four years after entering that program. So we had to put everything off. And um, I felt really badly about it because it really is something that I can see them doing in the future. There's such a great need for vocational programs. And uh, it's just really, uh, in a perfect world, they would have been able to do it this year. And they, they couldn't. But they still, you know, they have the drafts. They've done the research. So they'll be ready to go when the budgets are better. Thank you. Excellent. No further questions? Perfect timing, 6.45, right on a button. Bevitt called me ahead of time and said, don't worry, I'll be out of there at 6.45, so we'll end the meeting on time. Thank you, as, as they did say as well, I wanna just say I appreciate it as a citizen and as a, as a counselor, the work you're doing as it pertains to being on that school committee and on our school, school committee. Neither job is easy, so thank you. Thank you all very much, and I'll come back anytime you want. Great. Accept the motion to adjourn. So moved.